we need to come up with interesting ways to think about uh, how to deal with financing for a range of issues you know i i, I one of the reasons i'm un um, happy in a way with the literature on multipolarity is it kind of gives up on the idea that there are obligations treaty obligations um that western countries have uh, particularly to the global south for instance um the climate agreements that have been made there's a treaty obligation that countries of europe united states actually all, canada as well uh, japan to some extent they have a treaty obligation to fund um the transition from uh, carbon emissions to other forms of 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 energy use you know that's that's called a climate fund it, it's been established they have a treaty obligation they need to pony up you know you can't just say let's avoid them and and move on um then as well uh, we have the question of the international monetary fund and the way in which it continues to operate in countries of the global south uh, you know fighting to push for further austerity so a ghastly agreement on the table in 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 zambia you see what the imf did to sri lanka 16 imf agreements effectively impoverished sri lanka and you saw the complete collapse of 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 the political system such collapse of the political system that an old us government ally ranil vikramasinghe takes power you know that mass protests that took place had the effect of getting rid of a real ghastly family the rajapaksha family but it put in place ranil vikramasinghe there was no pro people agenda that was able to um uh, to appear you know at the time so you know this idea that we don't have obligations um that we want the west to meet uh, that that should not be forgotten you know the literature on multipolarity doesn't deal with this enough and furthermore you know when you talk to say officials in china they are very clear they are not interested in a multipolar world as such you know um they don't want a divided world in, in fact the funny thing danny is that right now washington dc is is the anti globalization people uh, they want to create walls they want to sanction half the planet they want to create um you know a divided planet it's the it's the chinese who are saying no we want to live on one planet except that we want our sovereignty to be um you know to be to be recognized and we don't want to take orders from from the united states you know what very interesting this business about russia if i can end with this point um you know when the soviet union was destroyed by gorbachev who died recently um in 19 from 1991 till 9, 2007 russia was a pliant state of the united states you know both under boris yeltsin that drunkard who was handed uh, the keys to the kingdom first by gorbachev and then by the us government and then secondly to vladimir putin putin was brought in as a safe pair of hands because he agreed not to prosecute yeltsin or the cronies who had stolen so much of the people's wealth in russia until 2007 putin was a pretty pliant guy he did us's bidding in fact things were so bad and danny you may not remember this but thomas friedman wrote an article in the new york times one of his ridiculous articles where he said we're rooting for putin you know this is thomas friedman uh, rooting for putin in 2007 putin goes to the shanghai uh, sorry to the munich security conference and he gives a speech there and that's the first time putin stands up against the west he says in that speech we don't want one single master a very important speech I, i recommend people go and find it on youtube and watch the speech it has subtitles he speaks in in russian we don't want a single master says putin okay look you know they are not saying we want to live in a bifurcated world bring up the um you know the uh, the iron curtain again in fact what the russians have been saying what the chinese have been saying is we want europe to integrate with asia we want eurasian integration it's actually the united states that's blocking that because they know mm. that if um asia, europe integrates with the rest of asia europe will be lost to the atlantic project and so it's the united states that's been using really quite aggressive tactics ukraine becoming one of the front lines to either delay or block entirely um eurasian integration so you know this business about multipolarity i know there's a lot of discussion about it but fascinatingly 
uh, in the capitals where people are thinking, oh, these are going to be the new polls, people, high officials there are saying we are not interested in being a poll. We actually want to live mm -hmm. with the UN charter being um, honored. Yeah, I think one th one mistake that I think is often made, and I think this is a problem in Western, we call it the Western left politic, politi uh, polity, the politics of the Western left, is that oftentimes things are seen as very objective, like or subjective, like just ideas in people's heads, right? I think whenever I hear China and Russia reference multipolarity, which they do reference it a lot, but it's not in reference to something that they are charging forward with as a political mission as some kind of guiding for uh, as, as their ideology it's about uh what is just happening in the world right that there is this uh a uh, uh, trend that's going on where the united states is the hegemon and it's trying to prevent countries from being able to assert their sovereignty and it has created and has necessitated more unity and more cooperation among countries that are being targeted by this hegemon. And then uh, there is always a consistent advocacy. I mean, right now you could say with Russia, for example, that because of how intense the aggression has become, right? There's no room for negotiation. Europe, uh, the US, they're not interested in, a ne in negotiating with Russia. The sanctions, uh, Russia is the most sanctioned country in the world right now. Uh, the weapons just keep flowing into Ukraine and it's just it's just a lot it's just very provocative so but up until that point russia was saying we want to have europe and the united states as deep partners and so was china and china still uh, talks about this and still tries to engage in this way because i think that's what their definition of multipolarity is it's we have our sovereignty we work together because we need to, we have to, and we have the right to, we have the right to be sorry, we have the right to be independent. We have a lot of commonalities in the globe with the global South, with it, Eurasia is very connected politically, economically, culturally, but we also want to have stable relations with these very forces who are creating a dynamic where such a thing cannot occur. At least that's how I see it when I hear uh, 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 you know, Xi Jinping or anyone else talk about multipolarity. It's it's something that's happening. It's not so much an idea that is being forwarded as some kind of a political project or end goal. It's it's just what is happening right now, <laughs> and 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 uh, uh, you know, it's something to navigate as as uh, things develop. I mean, I think you're you're right, but let let's say take two uh, points out of what you've said. One is, I think. Multipolarity is a word, and I don't want to get hung up on this, but as a word is being used as what is not unipolarity. Um, you know, it's it's an open signifier. It can mean anything. Uh, but what they everybody agrees is we want an end to unipolarity. That was Putin's statement, no single master. Uh, he was highly attacked, by the way, for that speech by um, the press in the West for having said that. Uh, so, yeah, th th there's a great desire no longer to have to be dictated to what Noam and I call the Godfather. Um, you know, in this book, the, the, the withdrawal, we, we describe U.S. power as a sort of mafia, um, that the U.S. government operates as a Godfather uh, on behalf of private corporations and so on. So, yes, that's one, one point, that there's this desire not to be dictated to by, by anybody and so on. Um, the other important thing here is that, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion that after the United States, China, uh, this theory of uh, hegemony, as it were, comes from a reading of European history that, you know, if, uh, earlier there was the, the world capitalist system centered on the Italian city states, and then it moves to Amsterdam, and then it moves to the city of London, you know, with the finance and so on, the British Empire, and then with the decline of the British Empire, the center of capitalist hegemony goes to the United States. Well, there was a discussion over the last 10 years that, well, the United States is in decline. Now the center will be China. Um, I've put this question to a number of Chinese academics, people in government and so on. Um, you know, there's this whole discussion about the Thucydides trap and so on. The Chinese, in fact, what they say is interesting. They say that there is no necessity 
of having a central power in the system, particularly since they are trying to innovate uh, something that is not exactly, you know, the capitalist system. They are trying to innovate something. Uh, call it socialism, which is an, a platform of innovation. It's not actually, you know, a formula. It's a way to uh, improve the sovereignty and dignity of people. Uh, they are innovating something, but they make it very clear. China doesn't want to be at the center of the world. You know, in fact, when Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech a few years ago on the Chinese dream, people said, oh, this is going to be like the American dream. You know, it's going to be a captivating, soft power uh, way of, of, of uh, appealing to the world's people. You know, how the American dream says everybody on the planet can be an American. That's the fantasy of the American dream. We know if that is to come true, we'll need like 50 planets, uh, given the rate of consumption of people in the US, personal consumption and aggregate consumption. Well, what Xi Jinping talked about with the Chinese dream wasn't a dream for all the people in the world that they become Chinese. It was for the dream of the people of China. Um, it was about how the Chinese people want to exercise their sovereignty. They don't want another century of humiliation how the Chinese people were going to eradicate poverty and so on. And when I talked to people and said, well, why didn't Xi Jinping make a statement about the world? They said, well, other countries should make their own statements. It's a very interesting thing. You know, we're entering a phase where leading powers in the world for the first time in world history, perhaps since um, the Soviet Union was around, uh, leading power in the world is saying, hey, listen, everybody, you've got to have your own projects. There needs to be a project either for the African continent or for the various countries in Africa. There needs to be a project in South America. I mean, I was just in Brazil. People around the campaign of Lula da Silva, who most likely is going to win the election in October, they're talking about creating a regional currency called the SUR. Um, they want to build a currency not only for inter uh, cross-border trade, you know, between, say, Brazil and Bolivia, but also to hold reserves. That's interesting. Uh, begs the question of who the hell is going to underwrite your currency. If Brazil, the largest economy in that region, could be an interesting development. But the point that I'm trying to make is the Chinese aren't saying, look, we are articulating a Chinese dream for the whole planet. We want the whole planet to become Chinese. That was what the American dream was about. They are saying, come up with your own dreams, guys. And I'm actually very sympathetic to that argument. Countries, regions need to come up with their own projects. And I must say, we're doing a terrible job of coming up with our own projects.